Hi, Chanel. Hi, Nicole. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Hi. So I'm looking at the email. There's a couple of um, members that are going to join late. Um, and I think one or two can't make it, I think. But we should still have quorum for um, tonight's meeting. We'll just need to give colleagues a few minutes before we kick off. Just bear with us, Nicole. Understood. Hi, Jay. How are you? Hello. I see that we have uh, two members of the public. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're, we're just waiting for a few more committee members to join before we can start the meeting. So just um, bear with us and, and thank you for joining tonight. Thanks. Hi, Marshall. Hey, Mario. How are you? Feels like it's been a while. <laughs> well, my doctor says I'll survive for a little while. <laughs> Hopefully longer than a little. <laughs> Things. It's good to have you. Oh, thank you. I'm going to kind of be in the background because I'm trying to eat a little something. Okay, do what you need to do. Not a problem. Hi, Bruce. How are you? Good to see you. We're just waiting for probably one more member before we can start. Oh, okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. hmm.
Jay, um, while we wait, thank you for preparing the draft resolution. Um, I did not have a chance to look at it, um, but happy to maybe share my screen if you want to talk to what you've uh, put together. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, awesome. I tried my best. Uh, it's my first time doing one for the board. No, I'll, there's always a first time. We'll do it together. <laughs> Okay. So once again, we um, have to the members of the public, we're waiting uh, to reach quorum, which I think we now have um, in order to be able to start this evening's meeting. Uh, so I'll go ahead and turn my camera on. Oops. There you go. Thank you, Chanel. Um, yes, we do have quorum. Wonderful. Okay. Um, thank you, Chanel, for your uh, support. Um, I know that we now have online Emily and Jay to help out with the uh, Zoom. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining uh, tonight's meeting or the May meeting of the Housing and Human Services uh, meeting uh, for Community Board 12. We do have a packed but I think, you know, all of these very, very important items, um, you know, there's a lot of things happening in our community. Um, and so. We will. Um, um, and then we'll go through the agenda. Uh, so again, good evening, everyone. My name is Marielle and um, I serve as chair for uh, this committee. Thanks. Um, over to you, Bruce. Hi, I'm Bruce Robertson on the committee for a couple of years now. Nice to see you all here tonight. Thank you. Marshall. Okay, I was just getting ready to jump in. I'm Marshall Vanderpool. Um, I'm a public member on the Housing and Human Services Committee, uh, formerly first vice president of the Dykeman Resident Association, Dykeman Houses, New York City Housing Authority. Uh, I'll land my plane right here. Uh, Jay? Uh, yes, Jay Baez, uh, uh, first year as a board member. Uh, completed my first year this month, and um, I was born and raised in Washington Heights. I'll pass it on to Emily. 
Hi everyone, I'm Emily Marte. I'm co-chair of Housing and Human Services Committee and I've been in Washington Heights uh, 30 years. Uh, happy to be here. And I'll pass it to, uh, can hmm, Aisha speak? Hi. My name is Aisha Oglevy. I am a member of this committee. I've been on the community board for 10 years as of last month. Um, I also serve on land use and I've been in the community for 43 years. Good to see everybody. Thanks, Aisha. Um, I think that's everyone from the uh, committee. Can I just ask really quickly, Chanel, before we, ah, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. If, if we could please promote um, our city council person, please. Thank you. Um, and Jamila as well. Um, uh, Jamila looks like it's online as well. I don't, I don't think I have, I'm host or have co-host privileges. So if you could support with that, thank you. Um, all right. So thank you again, everyone. Um, so the agenda for tonight's meeting, I'm just kind of going to pull it up right now. Uh, we do have a long but exciting agenda um, this evening, and we're going to start with a presentation from the Department of Veteran uh, Affairs. We do have Nicole Jones with us today uh, or this evening. So Nicole, um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you for the first part of our uh, meeting this evening. Thanks for joining us. And please do introduce yourself. I take myself off of mute. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Jordan Jones. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Outreach at Department of Veteran Services. I'll make sure everyone can see and hear me okay. Thank you for having me gonna share my screen. I won't be before you long, but I definitely wanted to share information with you about the Department of Veteran Services. For those of you who do not know that we exist, we do. It's the only agency in the United States that's dedicated to veterans in a state. So we are, one, we are the one and only um, in the United States. And hopefully there will be a time where there will be other states that will follow suit and, and every state and city will have something um, for veterans to be able to flock to and get re and help get resources and access to benefits and other things that I'll discuss. So I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay, is everyone able to see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, so for those who don't know, we are the Department of Veteran Services and we're located downtown right across from City Hall Center Street. So you can feel free if you have questions to come to our, our offices. We're on the 22nd floor and one Center Street. In case you didn't know, that's where our headquarters are. So DVS mission is focused around three particular areas, community engagement, advocacy and, and targeted advocacy and outreach and also we like to say service and compassionate service. And what that means is that we act as an intermediary for the federal government, right? So DVS itself does not have the authority to make changes to veterans status or anything like that. But what we do do is work as an advocate for veterans with the federal government by helping them with benefits and other things. So here is just a breakdown of kind of what New York City veterans look like. Currently, we have about six different categories of veterans. First is a senior category, and that's anyone 65 and older. And you can see out of the 210,000 that are right now in the city, a bulk of them are probably in the senior area because we're talking a bulk of our veterans are Vietnam vets. So that would be about my dad's age and older. And so that will be 65. We have retired veterans or retired, and those are individuals who served 20 years 
of service or more. Then we also have service-connected veterans. Those are veterans that uh, suffer from a disability. So they were no longer able to perform duties due to a service-related disability. Then there are those that have active duty, which are serving currently. Then we have reserve or National Guard, and those are individuals that are part-time. And then we also have student veterans, which are in the service, but they are right now pursuing program graduate degrees or higher education. So those are the six type of veterans that kind of fall into this map that you're looking at. So the areas we focus on right now live, learn, live, learn work in NYC. So those are the areas we like to focus on. And what that means is living. We help those who are already here get access to benefits if you don't already. Um, unfortunately, what happens a lot of times are for a number of reasons, you have some people that are veterans but don't identify as veterans. Um, everyone has different experience being in the service. And for some, they maybe due to the way things are, are handled or their status, they think maybe I don't qualify for this or they don't apply. So what we do is we have a claims department that their sole focus is to help veterans reach out federal government and see what they qualify for and really get veterans to self-identify, first of all, to know that, that you are a veteran and to find out what you are able to do because of your time in service, what you're accustomed to and what you are able to apply for and receive from the federal government. We also help veterans with housing support from the federal government. So again, we don't provide any of this ourselves, but what we do do is we have a, we partner with Department of Homeless Services, Department of Social Services, which is under DSS, and we have a shelter called Borden located in Brooklyn, and that is a veteran shelter where any veterans, a veteran men's shelter, or veterans who are in need of help that are in New York City that don't have housing, that is where they get support. So we work directly. We have a housing rep um, director that's there uh, full time and are able to help veterans and those with veteran status to get access to these different resources um, and vouchers that are available through the federal government. We also offer financial assistance for veterans. Uh, we connect them with different um, counseling, we, uh, tax prep, all of those things that they may need due to particular kinds of services, um, could be moving from different locations, just different things that come up that you may need special, so you may need someone to really identify your resources and your services, particularly because you're a veteran. Well, we also work to help veterans with mental health and wellness. So, um, this year, we were just able to get on an executive director of veteran services of mental health at our veteran services. We're, we are only a staff of about 40 individuals, but like I said, we were able to uh, recruit someone, um, Lauren, to do Lauren DeMillo, to do focus solely on counseling services and mental health um, for our veterans. And she does programs where she works with uh, VSO, other veteran organizations. Um, she works with different crisis hotlines. So anything that we can do to help the mind, body, and spirit of veterans. Uh, we also work with uh, Vet Connect, and we work with Workforce One and others to help veterans with employment. Again, we focus on live, learn, and work. And working in New York, we know, is, is a big job and it's a hard task, and it's expensive to live and work here. So we do offer services and connect people with organizations and programs that exist to try to help specifically veterans to get back, and family members as well. We don't want to leave out that we have family members of veterans that, are, that care give for them. So we also help those as well. So veterans and veteran family members. Okay, so what's happening now is we are working on what's called the wall that heals. I don't know if you, if anyone has ever heard of it before or if anyone has visited the wall of heal in DC, but the wall that heals is the one that's traveling that's coming to New York City, um, September 28th to October 1st is a traveling replica 
of the Vietnam Memorial Wall that's in DC. So it's coming to New York City and it's a large undertaking and commissioner and DVS is proud to bring this to New York. It's gonna be in Flushing Meadow Park and it's gonna be open 24 seven for individuals to come. Um, it has the wall, the way the wall is shaped, you can take your hand and you can rub, we call it a rubbing wall is what it's called, where you can rub your hand across and you can kind of feel the embossing of the names. So if you've been to 9-11 uh, Memorial, if you've been there and you've felt that, it's very similar. So you can uh, feel the names and you can just have a connection to those that sacrificed for our country. The wall is about 400 feet long and 800 um, and eight feet wide. Again, it's gonna be in Flushing Meadow Park. It's gonna be there. We're gonna have a 53 foot trailer that's bringing it in. We're gonna have um, over a hundred volunteers working to man it day and night again, because it's open 24 hours. So what we're doing now in preparing for the wall that heals is one, getting out to all of the community, let people know that it exists. And then also letting people know that if you have family members that serves in the Vietnam War, we also want you to reach out to the wall that heals for one, two, for them to be recognized, for them to be honored, and to just make sure that they are part of this celebration as we look and we honor and we celebrate those that gave their life and sacrificed hugely to protect this country during that time. Uh, DVS has a newsletter that we put out every week that goes out to those who sign up. So I encourage people to join our website and sign up. And what we have in a newsletter is all veteran source resources, veteran resources. We also have any job opportunities that come our way. So there might be organizations that have programs that specifically target veterans. We'll share that information in our newsletter. Um, we also share um, for students and anyone who's looking to come study here in New York City will share that New York City has a partnership with a city university for veterans to be able to get admissions. So they have a mission right away if they served. So there are different programs um, that are offered in the city here that people may not know about. So all that information is shared in our newsletter, um, also social media. We do something this year that we started called Veteran Changemakers, where we honor two veterans each month for their sacrifice in and outside of uniform. So those veterans that continue to do work in the community, be it serving on community boards, running on nonprofits, working with veteran service organizations, any of those things. So we have veterans that are nominated in, people come into our office or they email us, or we get um, recommendations via different meetings, our veteran advisory board meeting that we do um, every quarter and people nominate and then we have a selection process and we honor two every year. At the end of the year, which is November, our big Veterans Day breakfast, we then again bring up all of the veteran change makers um, with the mayor and just give them again special recognition. And we started this this year just as a way to really honor those who continue to serve New York outside of uniform. And, and that's what I have for you so far. Um, I know I could go on with some detailed services. I can make sure that I can give you a copy of this so that you can have and one that's um, embossed from our comms department so that you can then share it and also get access to our email address and our website so that you can see more detail, that you can see in more detail our resources that we offer to veterans and families. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, very helpful and insightful for you to share uh, all of that with us. Um, I do see two hands from our committee members. We also have public um, and for our members public, if you have any questions, um, I'll first go to our uh, committee members. But if you as a member of the public have a question, do raise your hand and um, you will be recognized. Uh, I think I saw Aisha over to you and then Bruce, go ahead. Hi, uh, so thank you for your presentation. This is something that is uh, very near and dear to me. I come from a military family. My mom is actually one of few family members 
that didn't serve in the military, but I have many aunts, uncles, cousins, et cetera, that all have, and that also includes um, my father, um, who I believe served during wartime when people were serving in Vietnam, but I believe he was stationed at Walter Reed Medical Center, if that makes sense. Um, also, so I have many friends also that have served, and I, you know, being that I have a personal relationship with them, I can see some of how uh, their service has impacted their life, both good and unfortunate. Um, and so my question is in relation to um, how does the VA monitor for the needs of service members or veterans um, so that they're not potentially falling through the cracks. Um, and I also am curious, um, what if someone is from, because this seems like the New York City bucket where the Veterans Affairs is concerned. Um, so what if someone is from New York City originally, but they're located somewhere else or serving somewhere else? Could they still use the New York City services? So I'll take the first part, um, I'll take the second part first. So it's not just New York City services. So what we do is we act as a intermediary. So we don't provide or we can't, we can't give you any services ourselves. So we don't have the budget and we don't have the ability, but what we do is we work as intermediaries. So we work with the federal government, the programs that exist to try to help veterans. And then there are also many veteran service organizations where veterans who are no longer serving establish these organizations with firsthand knowledge of kind of what, what veterans go through and they offer programs, um, whether it's around mental health, sometimes uh, just around uh, physical health, um, around access to resources for families. Um, a lot of times you have children who are, are children of veterans and they move around a lot of places. So um, getting accustomed to different locations or understanding how to um, get comfortable with moving around, just different things like that. So we help to forge relationships with existing organizations. So there's nothing that we can provide for those veterans. But if you do, say, for example, we had a veteran who is a Buffalo soldier. So he served World War II and right now he's in Tampa no longer in New York City. Um, his family did reach out because he was being honored in Tampa for his work. So we weren't able again to attend, but what we were able to do because he was a New York City resident, he retired from Department of Corrections, we were able to send down a citation information. Um, and we also had a situation where we had someone who lived in another state, but we were able to assist them with burial information so they can contact the VA for burial. So we do that kind of thing. We help people in that kind of way. Um, your first part of your question is also connected to the second. So what we would do is work with the individual and the VA or veteran service organizations. Sometimes people are hesitant based on different experiences, maybe to work directly with the VA. So in that case, we would partner with veteran service organizations that maybe order um, offer mental health services or whatever is needed. So it, it really is on a case by case basis, but we work with organizations along with the federal government. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Nicole and Aisha. Uh, Bruce, over to you and then Richard. So thank you very much, Ms. Jones. That's an awesome work that you do. Uh, uh, how can we help you as a, as a community board get the word out? Because you know, you're dealing as an intermediary providing all these services or direction to services. And uh, I'm a little bit confused how we can help help our constituents in uh, CB12, thank you. Okay, so the biggest thing that we are struggling with right now in transparency in the city is really self-identification. Um, I'll be completely transparent. My father was a Vietnam vet and he never spoke about it. And I didn't even know he was a vet until he passed away that when he died of cancer. And we then had to start the process of connecting with the VA. 
Um, so as a teenager, I went my whole life not knowing that he served because it was something he never discussed. So there are a lot of individuals like that that live in, in New York City that have served, that are veterans, but because of their own experience, they just push it out of their, out of their minds or they just choose not to identify. So we're really working on trying to get individuals to self-identify. Um, one of the things we're looking to possibly do, um, I heard um, uh, Mr. Marshall mention that he worked um, with NYCHA, that he was part of a tennis association. We know that there are veterans that live in NYCHA. Um, we want to be able to reach out to veterans and get them to start self-identifying, be able to um, reach out and share the benefits that are available to them. Um, I have a 90-year-old uncle that lives in the Bronx, lives over on Tinton Avenue. And the first time he took advantage of his benefits was a year and a half ago when I started working at Department of Veterans Services and I started asking questions. And he first got eyeglasses last year. Again, my uncle Gates is 90 years old. He served in Korean War and he never... He never thought about utilizing it. He got a job with NYCHA. He just used his NYCHA benefits and that was in the story. And it wasn't until I was exposed to DBS and what's available that I was able to communicate it with him. So it's just simply sharing information with people like yourself and you sharing information with others and letting them know where to find us so that we can get people to start self-identifying and really find out what's out there for them because there are benefits, there are money, there's access to things that people are not getting for various reasons. Um, one follow-up point, is that something where you can get the mayor to make some sort of announcement about this? The mayor has been very helpful with um, coming to our events and helping to get the word out, but we're continuing an ongoing work. So we have events coming up um, we're doing uh, events for Fleet Week, working with the Navy. Um, we just did a uh, Vietnam Veterans Day, working with the United Veterans War Council. So in addition to the mayor, we're, we're trying to work with as many people as possible. We're trying to work with the United States Post Office as well, because we know a lot of veterans often work there. My godfather was a veteran. As soon as he left the service, he got a job with the post office. So we're trying to um, tap a lot of different resources. But I will nudge the commissioner again and just see what additional resources we can get from City Hall. But thus far, the mayor has definitely been exceptional in, in helping yeah. us. Thank you. Fleet Week is a great time to, to, to push this. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, um, definitely share those, uh, you know, now, now that we've connected, Nicole, um, those flyers and things. And at least at the minimum I think we can do is at least share it on our listserv. Um, but we also have uh, the presence of, um, you know, some of the staff members of some of our elected representatives on the line as well. And so as they're engaging, you know, with constituents and things, um, I'm sure they can also, you know, put the word out as well. Um, Richard, over to you. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Jones, for tonight's presentation. Um, I want to speak a little bit from my day job. I manage a senior center. Last July, we had a representative from the Department of Veterans Services come to the senior center to make a presentation. She spoke both to the group of seniors and to some individual seniors about um, issues they had. There's been no follow-up. Um, it didn't come from her end, from our end, what efforts we've made to reach back to her. Um, were not successful. And I've been getting some questions again lately from people. I will acknowledge at this point, the contact is lost and I can't give you that per. you know, it wouldn't be polite to give you that person's name right now openly, but I also don't have that. So my question is, can we work with you either to reconnect with that person or find a way to restart the relationship with Department of Senior Services? It is a set of services that makes a lot of sense to offer in senior centers. And if we can turn this into a positive, we certainly would be glad to help you connect with other senior centers. Uh, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that may also have happened is um, our staff is very lean. So we've had a number of people that have, that have gone on to different opportunities and not, are no longer with Department of Veterans Services. 
And unfortunately, as you guys know firsthand, due to budget, we're not in the, in the place right now to replace them. So a lot of times what happens is you may email someone who's no longer with us. Um, so again, when I started, we were at 40. And I think right now we might be at 34 people. So it's that we operate to run. And outreach itself is myself and I have one additional staffer. So we are lean. But with that being said, we're working with community boards, elected officials, people like yourself, and we'll definitely, we want to definitely follow up and share information. So if I can put my email in the chat. I'll also share it um, with your host and please feel free to reach out to me. Will do. Response appreciated. No problem. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, I, I was going to suggest we also have, um, you know, obviously it sounds like, uh, you know, your team is doing the rounds and as it comes to the community boards. I mean, we also have a committee on aging um, and I can connect you with uh, the chair for, for that. Um, and I think, you know, that could also be obviously a good, good touch point as well. Um, and if you haven't already, you know, whether it be the uh, wide meetings that uh, the district managers have um, could also be another great touch point. But yeah, I can follow up offline with you on that. I see that Aisha, you have your hands up again. Over to you. Yeah. So I, I wanted to know how do we get the information about nominating a veteran? I'll what add is- that in. I'll add that in the chat as well. But you can email. You can email me, and then you can also go to our website. But I'll add that information in the chat for you. And I know we have we have sent information to this year. We started sending our resource guides to community boards and uh, elected officials' offices. Um, again, we're lean. So right now we have successfully um, sent it to all 59 community boards, 51 elected officials uh, in city council. And now we're working on um, assembly and we have the five borough presidents that we sent it to their office. So we're slowly chopping away at it, not as quickly as, as we would like, um, but we're slowly chopping away to make sure that people have access because we know how much access you have to the community. So if they have access to you and you have access to us, then that's a way that we can that we can help. And is that a physical document or? Uh, yes. yes, yes, it's a physical document. It's a book, um, it's available online as well. So I'll put that in the chat. I'll also share the link to that in the chat as well. Okay, great. And and last, um, you mentioned wanting to connect with NYCHA so that you can help people to self-identify. And I wonder, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that maybe you already do, but I wonder how that functions where shelters are concerned. Um, specifically, we have a SPMI shelter in our district, severe and persistent mental illness. And I know uh, people that have been, for instance, residential aides at that facility and have mentioned concerns that they feel a, a good amount of people in that residence may be veterans. Um, and so considering that they are SPMI, that may create a conflict with them self-identifying. But, and, and I, I have wanted to do more, you know, research or see how I could, you know, help to get an understanding there. But of course there are HIPAA rights. Yes. Um, so that creates a barrier. So w- what can happen there? Because I would assume they would best be served uh, connecting with, with the VA or veteran services um, to help them subsist in different ways in addition to the, the the services that they may already be getting. But how can we facilitate that with that barrier? Um, what is what does the VA do for situations like that? So one of the questions, and I'll again I'll put my information in the chat and maybe we can discuss Aisha more offline um, if you're available later on next week or sometime tomorrow. But one of the questions I would have that would kind of pop up is the type of shelter. So uh, Department of Homeless Services under DSS, they do have a question when people come in, are they a veteran? So that's that's on the form that people come in and fill out. Um, however, if it's a shelter or if it's a, a location run by the state, I don't know that they have that question. And then that information is not filtered back to us because the relationship is not the same. So there are some things um, that could definitely use a better bridge. And maybe 
working with community board and people like yourself is a way for us to tighten that bridge, tighten that gap. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aisha, and thank you, uh, Richard and Bruce. Can I just check if there are any last questions from committee members uh, for Nicole? And I, I don't see any hands from the um, attendee list either, so. Okay, seeing none, um, thank you, Nicole, uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, thank you for the, me. for sure. Um, this is the start of a relationship. Um, we certainly hope that you, you know, can join us when you are able, you know, for instance, you know, the activities around Fleet Week, as Bruce mentioned, if you can share that with us, uh, we can share with, you know, throughout the community, um, other events. I know you talked about the exhibit coming uh, later in the fall and ways, you know, maybe for us to volunteer something or, you know, something that we can do there as well. There, there, there's scope. Great. Um, so let's, um, let's certainly remain in touch and thank you for all you do. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. I uh, Before we move on to the next agenda item, which is the discussion of uh, the impact of vacancy rates across um, agencies, um, I did note that there was an omission on the agenda which is to discuss um, the draft resolution council. Um, so I wanted to put Mo on the floor or something um, to add that to this evening's agenda. Uh, it broke up on my end. It's a resolution for, uh, all I heard was council, it was breaking up. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, this is the uh, resolution on the right to counsel. So if you recall last meeting, we were joined by council member Abreu um, and we as a committee agreed to um, put forward a resolution in support of both uh, the intro and the resolution um, on the right to counsel. Um, and so it was drafted by Jay and it was, oh, I forgot to add it to this evening's agenda. <laughs> and so I just wanted to uh, ask if someone can put a motion on the floor for us to discuss that this evening. Did I break up again? I think Richard is raising his hand. Maybe he's proposing something. <laughs> Go ahead, Richard. No. Nope. <laughs> uh, well, I, I put a motion, um, considering that it's, it's really old business that we... <laughs> Just in depth, I see no issue. Um, so I, I put a motion forward so that we can add it to the agenda. Thank you, Aisha. Can I get a second? I second. Thank you, Emily. Um, any opposed? Okay. I don't see any oppositions, but I don't know, Richard. I see your hand up. I'm not sure if just you just forgot to lower it, or <laughs> um, maybe you have you want to add something. I no, I probably did. Let me let me just get what's that. You don't have to call on me right now. Let me get this thing out of the chat though first. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, we'll discuss that item later on in the agenda agenda um, because we do have um, Kiana and Jamila joining us this evening um, from council member de la Rosa's office. Um, so I do want to be respectful of their time. Um, so there are two items that we do have on the agenda. One is to discuss the impact of vacancy rates. So as some of you may recall from our meeting last month, um, we talked about the impact of the vacancy rates um, across agencies and, and departments and how that then um, seeps into, you know, kind of, you know, constituent services and um, things falling through the cracks, unfortunately. Uh, and so I just wanted to have a short discussion on it. Um, and then the second item under that also uh, with our colleagues um, from the council member's office is around the rent guidelines board. As you uh, may all know, they met earlier this week and kind of to discuss um, the range or the proposed range um, for rent stabilized apartments. So with that, we I just wanted, to, if anyone wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the vacancy rates or maybe I can turn it over briefly 
to uh, Kiana and or Jamila to talk a little bit about it. Um, and then we can we can talk on that about that for a few minutes. Thanks. Kiana, maybe say a few words. <laughs> okay, I was just waiting to be called on. Um, <laughs> hello, everybody. I'm Kiana Diaz. Many of you guys do know me. Um, I am the deputy chief of staff for Council Member Carmen De La Rosa. Uh, I'm so happy to be back in the community board setting. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, so the council member is currently the chair of the Civil Service and Labor Committee. Um, last year, she did hold a hearing regarding the municipal workforce. And what we have found is that there are several gaps in our agency uh, workforce, um, specifically around most of our agencies have like over a uh, 25. Let me one second. I have my numbers here. So currently at the city level, we have over 24,256 vacant positions across all of our city agencies. Um, that include uh, the highest, the some of the highest or agencies with the highest vacancies are the Commission on Human Rights, the Department of Building, Department of City Planning, um, HPD, uh, the Department of Investigation, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, right now, last year the mayor had asked for a four percent cut across agencies, and at this point, um, the agencies still weren't fully staffed. So there was a reduction, there was a vacancy reduction back in 2020 when the pandemic hit. And then last year when the new administration came in, um, they kept that, they kept the hiring freeze that was established under Bill de Blasio. And the thing was there was a hiring place in, there was a hiring freeze in place, but because people were leaving, a lot of people were leaving. And so due to attrition, you know, none of these positions kept on being filled. And with these positions not being filled, it led to a decline in services throughout the city. So now there is a big staffing gap within all of our agencies. Uh, right now, the council member is working to figure out a plan, which we'll come back and we'll report to the board in order to how to get New York City working again. Um, I have a couple of uh, information here. So most of our agency, they have vacancy, va vacancy rates of over 5%. Um, the Department of Buildings has a 24% vacancy rate. The DOHMH has a 19% vacancy rate. Um, and because there's no staffing in a lot of these agencies, they cannot do the work that they have to do. Now, given that this is the Housing Committee, uh, with HPD specifically, the commissioner came out recently and, you know, the HPD last year was supposed to produce 16,000 affordable units. Um, and so what ended up happening was he came out saying that they don't have the manpower to do it. They do not have the staffing capacity to do it. And now it takes them 371 days to complete, to complete a, an affordable housing lottery. So what's happening now, you guys see a lot of development going up and the lotteries aren't out yet. And that's because HPD hasn't produced them. And also because of the shortage, when you look at the Department of Building that has one of the largest shortages, they have almost 2000 people that are gone from the agency. Um, that includes our inspectors, and that includes our inspectors and the people that process the Department of Building application. So buildings that are getting built, sometimes what happens is that in order to get things moving quickly, sometimes DOB approve a project, and then you know these, the developers will begin doing what they're gonna do, and then you'll be coming back and reviews it, and it's actually like, wait a minute, you guys cannot build you guys are missing some paperwork, you guys are missing this, and it halts the project. And then the project is halted for like eight, nine, 10 months. Um, and then there's some development that have been waiting three, four years in order to get built just because the application is sitting at the Department of Building. Um, but we will come back with more information regarding the vacancy rate and with our plan to kind of get New York City working again. Thank you, Kiana. Um, really, really helpful. I mean, it's um, really astounding to hear hear that, and clearly the impact that that has, um, as you mentioned, in particular for you know housing and human services, uh, where there's such a need for affordable housing in our community, and the fact that things are taking long um, is is uh, frustrating. Um, Aisha, you have your hand up. 
Hello. Um, always good to see you, Kiana. Um, so thank you for uh, giving us that background data. Um, it, you basically elucidate concerns that I've had that I could sense, but I didn't imagine um, it was to the level of what you have expressed. Um, I'm seeing impact as I, you know, I do a lot of advocacy in the community where, for instance, people's renewals are, are falling through the cracks. They're not getting the right documentation. The applications are not being forwarded to them. When they fill out the application and forward it, it's kind of like a dead end and they don't hear back. They're emailing. You talk about through HRA? I'm, th I'm talking, yeah, through HRA and the agencies, which, you know, the umbrella of agencies that exist to support, you know, uh, housing, uh, vouchers, even in the shelter system, I'm seeing people who are in the shelter system that are expecting certain things to happen uh, and they're not happening the, you know, and, and un under the clock that we would normally assume for things to be processed. Um, and definitely in regards to Housing Connect, uh, where they're saying, you know, I, I but Housing Connect has always been a difficult area to navigate because, of course, there's so much demand. And so and then, you know, being that it's a lottery, you don't really know whether you should have been picked or not. But um, there's just been a feeling that people don't know where delays are happening or even when they have been approved there's issues with following through on the approvals but a lot of what i'm hearing from people is you know i'm calling i'm not getting an answer i sent an email nobody followed back to me and you know like that kind of thing um but you know of course where it could lead to evictions where it could lead to uh you know people not being able to subsist then that becomes a huge concern um and, I, and I'm curious how it's impacting our district, but yeah, so. So to touch a little bit on that, um, HRA has received the highest, some of the highest attrition rates. Um, I am gonna be completely honest with you all. We have a severe, severe staffing shortage in within our city agencies. Um, with HRA specifically, which oversee the Department of Homeless Services, um, they're, under, they're technically under one branch. Um, what has happened is, to be completely transparent, what has happened is that many of these units, once the migrant crisis hit, I remember there was also a, a hiring freeze in place. Once the migrant crisis hit, many of the workers were overwhelmed. They were working more than 24 hours a day. And with this work, they were not getting additional pay. They were not getting any changes in their title either. Wow. Um, and so there was more work that they were being overloaded with and they left. And because there was a hiring freeze in place, what has happened is that the people that stayed now had to take over the, their, their former colleagues workload. And due to that, you know, they also got overwhelmed and then they left. And because these positions have never been refilled, we are now in the position where we, for example, in our office, you know, we've been having a hard time with HRA because we have people who be certification for SNAP, be certification for, for their housing, has like fallen through the cracks. And it's not because they did not apply on time, it's because the system has a deadline and the people on the other side have not been able to process it by the deadline. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the situation that we're in now. And we're having conversations um, in order to try to figure this out. And what can we do as a community board um, to support the community, to raise awareness, to help people navigate you know, some of the, the holes that exist due to this. I think that y'all need to push for the mayor to hire more people. <laughs> okay. To refill, um, I think y'all need to push for the mayor to stop asking for vacancy, to mm. stop asking for cuts. Um, he just proposed another 4% cut through our agencies last month. Um, and most of those cuts come through reducing the headcount. So every year during the budget, they have a fixed number of funding that they need specifically for their staff, for their headcount. And so if you reduce it, that means that you can only, you're, you're limiting how much staff you can have in your agency. So if you keep on reducing it and you already know that your agency is overwhelmed, then this work is never going to get done. Does that make any sense? Noted. Thank you.
Thank you, Kiana. Um, the situation is definitely dire. Um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's bad. Um, I guess uh, a follow-up to Aisha's question about what can we do? Um, you know, are there things that we as the um, community board can, can look towards in terms of timeline of things, you know, whether it's be a resolution on some of this, um, mm -hmm. you know, how, how can we push some of this forward? And then I guess a, another question on the, the hiring bit, um, and this is me kind of not having much knowledge on kind of how, you know, hiring for New York City civil service works. Um, is it, in terms of those who are applying, are they actually receiving a lot of applications? Or what's your sense? Like, are people actually applying for, obviously oh. a lot of people are leaving, but are people mm -hmm. actually applying for roles? And if they are, is it that it takes like forever to actually get hired? Or is yeah. it also like, you know, there's no people to process the applications, you know, for for people to start the roles? That's part of it. Um, so <laughs> with the hiring process, there's three, there's two challenges that I can tell you off the top of my head. Um, so when the mayor does the first, an agency has to get approval from the mayor's office, right, in order to be able to hire all of these new people in. And so what has happened is when, obviously when the mayor came in, you know, they usually, a new administration usually brings in a whole group of new folks. Um, and those new folks, they get to decide which kind of agency that they want to work for. Um, or, you know, the new commissioner, they're like, okay, these are the applications that we're going to get in order to meet a percentage, a small percentage of our headcount. But you need to ask permission for that. And so the Office of Management and Budget will be like, yes or no. Right? They'll be like, okay, we have a little bit of money left, but you can pay this person this. Or actually, no, we don't have enough money in your agency to allow for this person to get hired. But one of the biggest challenges is the pay. So right now in the city, if you are applying to work for the city of New York and you did not work for your previous employment was not with the city of New York, then you can only get paid the floor. Mm. You can only get paid the floor. Um, and so if you have somebody that like worked at a corporate office, right, in terms of like doing contracts, right, and now they want to work for the city for the Department of Contracts, right, and they were getting paid at this corporate place like $110,000, mm -hmm. but if your agency um, is saying that, well, the floor is 60000 then that person now has to take a pay cut of 60000 and get paid 60000 That's one. And then the other part is that... Um, the hiring process. So it's been difficult for many applicants because they will apply and then they'll be like, you know what, I don't even want the job anymore. Because the hiring process takes about six to seven months. Oh my gosh. Yeah, what? it takes about six to seven months in order to get like approved. The fact that the quickest that I've seen has been like three months. Oh, wow. <sighs> mm. My reaction is exactly how that's... Yeah, no, I mean, those, those are things that, are, and, and it's unfortunate because um, it, it sounds as if people are interested, and people are applying, but there are, you know, all of these other conditions that um, that are making it hard for people. And, and yeah, and in a place as expensive as New York City, um, people with, you know, coming with skills from different, you know, backgrounds want to work for the city. And if they're going to get a, that much of a pay cut, then... I don't blame them, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kiana. Mm -hmm. um, any questions, any other questions from the committee on this item? So not not so much a question. If somebody else wants to go, um, let me give that opportunity before I jump in again. Okay. Just one second, Aisha, before you do. I also want to just, um, to the members of the public, if you want to ask a question, you can as well. Just raise your hand. Um, go ahead, Aisha. So um, this committee has considered um, over time this issue of uh, having the appropriate supports in different agencies, like specifically within HPD or DOB um, for inspections, right? And we've even put it in our budget rankings. Um, so considering what you're now saying, um, it seems like we're in, in dire straits. And something that I think that may be able to help, de definitely we need people 
to have jobs and we need people to be able to do the work of the city. But um, duplication of of efforts um, is something that I see happening. So for instance, there's somebody that I'm advocate, advocating for right now who has been in the shelter system for some time, who got a voucher, has spent months going to apartments over and over to finally get a landlord to say, I'm going to accept your voucher, which we know has been difficult to get landlords that will, will be friendly to that, right? Mm -hmm. However, the sink had an issue with one of the knobs with the hot and cold. So the city said, we cannot approve this apartment. The landlord needs to fix it, right? And then when the landlord, and it's a knob, like literally I, I personally feel like someone could have sent somebody to the hardware store and the, the, she would be in an apartment right now, mm -hmm. right? But okay, the process is what the process is. What happens is, is the landlord does fix it, but then for him to get someone to come back to say, yeah, the, the knob is fixed was another ordeal and more time. And then when they came to review the apartment again, they found something else that they didn't mention the first time. So why wasn't there a full on evaluation of the entire apartment to say, here are all the things that are problematic that the landlord needs to fix so that this person can move into their apartment and therefore out of shelter services, making a space for someone else who may have that shelter need, which we know is also an issue, right? Where our, our system is overwhelmed. So that just seems like, you know, the fact that uh, an inspector has to go there twice, that someone is left without housing, et cetera, et cetera. There's, you know, there's a hole in the in the process, the way that it works, right? So how can we, but these are things that I find out, you know, and I'm not even really boots on the ground. I'm just doing advocacy, helping people navigate these systems, right? But there's certainly people who are closer to this that may know and, and see on a regular basis what some of these, you know, problems are that could be addressed and you you would only require less people to do mm -hmm. that work if if those things were fixed, you know. So, just I agree with you. No, I agree with you. Okay. The whole listen when it comes to HPD, I think we all know that the whole system needs to be reformed. So, yeah, great. Um, thank you all um, for your points on that. Um, sounds like you know there's there's you know. This will be a continued uh, conversation um, with some opportunities for uh, some ways that we as the committee can support um, pushing some of this forward uh, and raising the alarm in terms of the impact that it has um, on everyday New Yorkers. Uh, so thank you, Kiana. Um, moving on to the next item on the agenda, it's the uh, New York City Rent Guidelines Board. Um, so as you know, um, I imagine most of you have, have seen on, on the news. Um, the Rent Guidelines Board met yesterday. Um, what feels yesterday, the day before yesterday, I'm starting to lose track of the days, but they met earlier this week um, to agree on a proposed range um, as it relates to rent stabilized apartments for both one year and two year leases. Um, prior to uh, the meeting this week, uh, some of you may have seen in the news that some of the, the rates um, or the percentages that were being floated around was as high as 16%. Um, and there were, um, understandably so, a lot of pushback. Um, you know, it's the, the cost of living obviously has gone up uh, even more than it, than it ever has been. Uh, you know, the rent in New York City is uh, astronomical um, and it's not right. Um, and so I know that um, Council Member uh, De La Rosa was there. Um, and so I, I wanted to turn it over maybe to you again, Kian or Jamila, maybe to talk a little bit more about that and um, present a draft resolution for this committee to consider. Over to you. Yes. So, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of the height, the range that they were proposing was absolutely ridiculous. Um, and because of it, we're in the middle of a housing crisis, as everybody knows. And Marielle, I know that before you and I spoke, when we and I spoke, I gave you the December 22 number. 
as to how many people are living in our shelter. I got the updated number. In our Department of Homeless Services shelter, we have 70,902 people currently living in our shelters. That is enough for people for a whole town. And so what happens is how can we have discussions about raising the rent, especially at 16% when our city is currently going through a financial crisis and we're going through a housing crisis and a mental health crisis um, and a shelter crisis too. So what the council member has put forward was a rent rollback. So she put in a resolution asking for the state to support uh, a rent decrease. Instead of a rent increase, a rent decrease. Um, and we're hoping that the board can submit a resolution in support of our bill. And that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kiana. Um, the floor is open um, mm -hmm. to the committee um, for discussion. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen in a moment. Um, but Aisha, I see that you have your hand up and then I'll turn it over to Richard. Aisha? So I wanna commend our councilwoman on having the political will to do that. Um, that is something that we housing advocates have been saying for many years that we needed a rent rollback and that was before the pandemic. I agree with that position wholeheartedly. And I suggest to the committee that we follow the lead of our councilwoman in our resolution. I land my plane. <laughs> Richard. Amen to that. But a question about the process. My understanding is that the key meeting of the rent guidelines board is happening next week. What is that? Am I reading it no, wrong? Or does it have some implications in terms of how fast we would need to do things and pretty much jump community board process a little bit? So the next meeting is going to be in June, which is, so they just voted on the range. And the meeting in June is when they decide the numbers, the actual numbers within that range that the one-year leases and the two-year leases, the percentages of the one-year leases and the two-year leases um, that are going to be applied. Uh, for the next coming year, the next coming year and the next coming two years. I would then move that we support this bill. Thank you. Okay. Um, before I turn it over to you, Jay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so what I have up um, just for awareness is the resolution that we passed last year. Um, the things that are highlighted in yellow just need to be updated. Um, and so there's there's that, but just for, you know, we'll, we'll update that, but just so everyone can take a look at it and, and how we can do this. Uh, Jay, over to you. No, the, I was going to answer Richard's question, but can I already answer And I also want to mention that we are working with a lot of advocates um, in order to completely reform the rent guideline board. So there are uh, plans, there are actions that we're taking. Um, and once we have those solidified and set in stone, I'll come back to the committee and present to the committee what those actions look like. Um, but it's basically around the line. Of, as you all know, the mayor can, appo can appoint five members to the rent guideline board. Um, and it usually shifts every single time that there's a new mayor, depending on, you know, where they stand on the landlord tenant issue. And so we want a more fair, balanced and like rooted in reality board as opposed to something that can just be uh, based on political favor. So we are working on the state level in order to try to reform the rent guideline board. Thank you, Kiana. Nice. Um, I'm sharing my screen. So can I ask for either, I know Emily's at a, is um, unable to engage at the moment. Jay, would you mind um, just calling on, on colleagues of the committee? Um, it's hard for me to see. Yeah, <laughs> share my screen. Thanks. Recording in progress. I think, I think Richard has a hand up. I think that's an old hand. No. Are there any other hands or um, from the public? 
Mm, no. No. Okay. So what I, I guess a question then, thank you. Um, oh, I think I see Anthony's hand up. It, I, and all of a sudden I got a notification. Cool. Um, before we turn it over to you, Anthony, um, my question would be to the committee. Um, do we include, I, I see this still as kind of one resolution talking about, you know, um, the, what it is that we propose in regards to the um, rent guidelines board and the, the range, but within that also include uh, both in the whereas and in the be it resolved that we support uh, the council members uh, resolution on rent rollback. Um, so I just want to get thoughts on that first and then um, over to you, Anthony. And if that makes sense. I think that's fine. It wouldn't be the, like the last portion where it'd be resolved, where we should like urge the city council to pass the resolution. Um, mm -hmm. So not having read this yet, um, I'm wondering, so what are our supporting whereas is for a rollback? And is that something that, well, I, I guess we can pull directly from the bill, um, but uh, what specifically for our district can we pull from? I'm assuming eviction rates, um, housing deficits, rent burden are all um, already in here. Um, the consumer index as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm assuming to make a make a request for a rent rollback is mm -hmm. that demands. I'm sure they they will imagine, but I think it's appropriate. Um, but um, how do we make the case? Sure. So so can I? I know that Anthony has um his hand up. Is it okay if I just quickly go through what we have here, noting that obviously some of the figures need to be updated because these are figures from 2022. Um, and so showing this and then um, over to you, Anthony, and then we can discuss as a committee. Is, is, does that seem like an okay approach for colleagues? Yes. Um, okay, great. Again, noting that this has not been fully updated. Um, so here it is, resolution urging New York City rent guidelines board for rent regulated apartments for one or two year leases. We can probably change the title of the resolution uh, because again, we agree that we also want to support the council members uh, resolution um, on rent rollback. Um, at this point, I just added here about kind of capturing the point about, you know, we're really at a, um, you know, there's a, the crisis is really from all angles, um, as, as Kiana mentioned, and I think it's important to capture that here. So we'll, that'll be kind of into some of this. But here it is um, stating that at the scheduled meeting, um, the public hearing, it was on May 5th of this year, this is what was proposed for one year uh, leases uh, commencing on or after October 1st, 2023, um, and on or and on or before September 30th, 2023, this is what has uh, they voted on, 2 to 5%. And then for two-year renewal leases, 4 to 7%. Um, and then this is kind of to your point, Aisha, where we talk a little bit about some of the statistics. Again, they need to be updated. But um, so the Rent Guidelines Board produces an income and affordability study. Um, and so updating these figures. And so it talks about, you know, kind of, you know, some, some of the indicators. I anticipate that the study is going to say quite differently in terms of positive indicators, um, unfortunately. Um, I mean, we did just hear, you know, the, the astounding number of New Yorkers that are currently in shelters, uh, 7,000. And I think we need to include that in here as well. Um, the Princeton uh, University has the eviction lab. Um, this is from last year uh, where they had at that point in last year, 2022, and it was kind of the end of the uh, moratorium. 
um, 29,000, you know, 636 eviction cases have been filed uh, across New York City. So again, that needs to be, be updated. Um, here talking about, you know, the backlog of eviction cases and housing courts. Let me see if I can actually make this a little bit bigger. So it's just easier for everyone to see. It's probably hard with the, is that a little bit better, hopefully? Um, calling on tenant groups um, to slow down the calendaring of housing court cases. I wonder if here, which we're going to talk about later on in this uh, in the meeting this evening, we can include a bit around our council member, uh, Shana Breo's uh, kind of legislation on both the intro and the resolution on right to counsel, which uh, Jay has kindly drafted. Uh, again, here a little bit about the housing and vacancy survey from HPD. These numbers need to be updated. The last one was in 2021. Um, the comptroller's report kind of monthly economic and fiscal outlook should be updated. Um, but these are all sources that I think we can still pull from. Um, it's just that, you know, uh, updating the numbers and this obviously here. So here, though, this is what we as a committee this, uh, last year, I, forgot, I changed the numbers. So these are the numbers for this year. Last year, I think it was like two to four percent and like four to six percent or something. But we actually voted as a uh, committee that we actually recommended zero to one percent. Um, and then I think it was four to six percent here, as you see. So. I mean, I my suggestion, obviously, being that we're also supporting um, the council members uh, resolution on rent rollback is obviously to uh, kind of push for in terms of the the be it resolved the lower end of the percentage range um, rather than the higher end. Um, and I so just wanted to talk that through. Jay, I'll turn it over to you if it's okay to um, moderate kind of who has hands up because I, I can't tell. <laughs> Thanks. So um, Aisha has her hand up and did you? Yes. So uh, one thing is something that stood out for me is the personal bankruptcy filings. It says that personal bankruptcy filings decreased by 24%. Sorry, one second. Which, uh, whereas is it? Um, If you scroll up, it's, it, it's part of the, the yellow highlight. Um, there at the top yes uh, mm -hmm. yeah. so I I don't know that that benefits us um because I'm imagining it's saying you know because if you were filing bankruptcy definitely that's the definition of financial mm -hmm. insecurity right mm -hmm. Um, but also I'm wondering what the correlation is, what's the causation, right? Because people could maybe not be filing for bankruptcy because they got a hefty stimulus or a PPP yep. or, you know, I don't know, <laughs> but so, money, mm -hmm. they, they, you know, during the pandemic, unemployment, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that may have assisted people in subsisting. Um, and they maybe had less expenses because they're home during the pandemic versus yep. moving about. Um, and so I personally wouldn't include that because I don't mm -hmm. think it helps our argument. Mm -hmm. So um, compl i fine with taking that out from, from my perspective. Um, <laughs> I think when it was included last year, it was under the premises of saying, well, this is what the rent guidelines boards is saying. But actually, if you see the last bit of that, Despite all of this, we know that evictions will increase um, sharply in this case, you know, by the end of 2022, following the eviction moratorium, the fact that we're still seeing so many eviction cases, but that's, I, I would take that as a friendly amendment unless there's any kind of other opposition. Yeah, I think we could still make the case without reminding them <laughs> of their erroneous <laughs> argument. <laughs> um yeah, and then the other thing I was going to say is I think um, if we're going to consider a rollback, mm -hmm. it should be on both ends. It should be both for one year and two year, um, because no matter which one you're, you know, applying for, you should you should get that benefit and not not have a raise or even a freeze. We've had freezes in previous years. And if the intent of this is to remedy the impact that people have had, then it should be done in both regards. 
Um, just quickly, if you can, how, how would you like, or how are you recommending that language be phrased? Oh, so, so um, that was the question that I had for um, Kiana. Mm -hmm. um, what is the bill recommending as far as um, percentages or, or does the bill recommend a percentage mm -hmm. when it references a rollback? So we're currently working, we're gonna add more language to the bill. Um, and in the bill, I am going to get that number to you on Monday because all the advocates are trying to come up with an appropriate number. So basically the number would be like a negative, right? So it will be zero to negative. It will be negative 1% to 0%. Right. Like instead of an increase, it will be like a decrease. I don't know if that makes any sense. Like yeah. there's going to be yeah. a negative one of the numbers. Yeah. Um, and so right now, the range that they're discussing is between one and two, as of right now. So I'm assuming, just for the purpose of this exercise, but maybe we can hold out until uh, the councilwoman office gets some of that detail, um, that we can maybe start with... Um, one percent well no, i think it would be higher on the on the one year as far as the negative maybe negative two percent to zero percent and then uh negative one person uh yeah negative one percent to zero percent on the two year if anybody's catching my my uh one, one second. Sorry, Aisha. Can you repeat it again for the one year? Yeah, I'm thinking negative 2% to 0% and then negative 1% to 0. Because I think that the end number in both cases would have to be 0. Otherwise, we're asking for an increase, which we don't want to do. Don't want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, um, sorry, the two year, I got distracted slightly. <laughs> Oh, ending uh, ending in zero percent. Negative obviously. one. Negative one to negative zero. One. What is it? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Jay, are there other hands up? And and just before we call on other committee members, I know that there are two colleagues um, from the public that have put something in the chat. Can I, can I ask for the purposes of um, our open uh, meetings law that you raise your hand? Um, we'll come to the committee, um, excuse me, the public after the committee members have spoken and, and you'll have an opportunity to make your point then. Emily is next. Emily, you wanna go? Not sure what happened. <laughs> I will unmute you. See if that will. So thank you. Oh my gosh, thanks. Um, you guys, I was just wondering, like, if there's anything because I don't know, I don't know much about this, but I don't know if something like that could be added to this about developers and them somehow having an influence on this, or would this be too far off from what we're trying to do? Like, I know that we're just talking about raising percentages, but I, I don't know why it just keeps, it bothers me that it's like not included in there or am I too far off from what we're trying to do there? So, um, and Aisha, I, I look to you as the housing expert in, in case I misspeak, um, but this is for rent stabilized apartments. Oh. Um, Emily, and so this isn't necessarily for kind of new developments. Um, it's for rent stabilized apartments. Um, and I, but I think there is a point, um, and I think this has been raised before that our district actually has a really high number of rent stabilized rent, rent stabilized and rent control departments. I don't know what that figure is, um, and I think you know talking about to Aisha's point, how can we make this um, specific to CB twelve? if we can find that information and capture that there. Um, 
I think that's important. I wonder though, to your point, Emily, maybe it's a whereas where we say, you know, the fact that, that you know, uh, rents are just, you know, so high, uh, you know, something to that effect. But I also want to be mindful of how long um, the resolution is. Um, we want it to be kind of impactful um, and we want to actually make sure people read it. If it gets too long, people won't read it. Yeah, yeah um, I understand. So it's that balance. I mean- I mean, yeah, yeah, definitely. I did add something that wasn't even related, but still at the same time, I don't know if it could become like a standard and it's not just, but yeah, it would make it longer. Like a standard across rent stabilized and like new buildings that are coming up. So it's not just like, you know, but yeah, I get it. I get it. So you na- you nailed it, Marielle. Um, I, but leaning in, in that frame of thought, as far as what's happening in the market overall, um, I think that we should also include what is happening with the acceleration of deregulation in our district, right? Um, Some of it is superficial, the way that it's happening. It's happening because people don't understand what the rules are for when they move into an apartment and the apartment has a certain rent, how it can be increased, whether it's by vacancy or, you know, MCIs, et cetera, that people don't have a full understanding. And sometimes it's increased artificially, which it should not be. um, And people aren't aware of the four year statute of limitations in order to say, hey, that should have never been increased and then it's stuck, right? Um, And so, and then also because of evictions, people moving out of the district, I think it's said that 300,000 New Yorkers have moved out, right? Um, Rents are, are, are being raised and as they go above the cap, then the apartments become deregulated. I think we should make a mention of what's happening where, where deregulation is concerned because it, uh, it it changes the dynamic of affordability in our in our district. So, and you know, we have a housing crisis, we have a homelessness crisis. Um, so, you know, obviously that's that's something that contributes, and I think we should mention it. Thanks, Aisha. Um, just noting the time and knowing that we have a couple of other agenda items still. Um, are there any other kind of I know one, if there are no oppositions to that being included, could you send me a few sentences on that or you know, a couple of words on that um, to include? And um okay. Jay, are there any other hands on this item? Uh, and if you could, wouldn't mind checking with the um attendees as well because i think there were two comments i think that i saw there there's no more um committee members just the attendees there's two hands okay do you want to go ahead and and call on them then i don't know thanks first will be anthony viola hey everyone um i just wanted to comment and this Comment may be a little stale, but I'm just curious whether or not there's any precedent to New York City's Rent Guidelines Board doing a rollback, um, and if perhaps the council member's office has any um, history on it. I think that if there is, and we can sort of refer to very specific moments where that's happened, that also may be very useful to include in this resolution as sort of a a tie back as showing this actually has happened before. Here is why. Hey, hello. I can't see who was the person that spoke, <laughs> but to our knowledge, there has not been a rent rollback. Um, but given that we're in unprecedented time, we're, we're going to need an unprecedented solution. So you got to start somewhere, right? right? <laughs> but but good point. I mean, I wonder if um, I mean, I don't I don't know if this would help, but, you know, the fact that there was a freeze during kind of at the height of the pandemic. Um, I don't know if it's helpful to include that, but say, you know, we need to go further than that this time. We recognize, you know, um, you know, there's inflation, there's this, there's that. It's a lot of other things as well. Um, so that, that could possibly be a, a way to capture some of that point. 
Um, Jay? Yes, the next person is Tiffany K. Hi, everyone. Um, I just uh, rate, I wrote this question in the chat, but I'll just say it out loud for those who can't read it. I would really love to know where the RGB got that figure from, where the source was. If anyone has access to the RGB, could we please, um, perhaps Kiana, you could ask them where that figure about the bankruptcy rates came from. And the second thing that I would point out is that it took, I think it was over a decade for the fight for 15 to happen, to have minimum wage increase to something that would be even considered a livable wage, which we all know is not. $15 an hour in New York City is impossible to live on. So that would be potentially something that you could include in the reso. Oh, and by uh, the way, Maria, I also sent you the email with the PDF. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, so for the first part, she wants to know where RGB got the vacancy rate number or the range number, I didn't hear it right. The bankruptcy filings, the personal bankruptcy filings. I was okay. curious to know where the source of that came from. Okay. Oh, and also Barry, and also looking across the city, they love to cherry pick things. So it's very easy to take data, for example, in like central Islip, right? Or Westchester. But we all know that that may not apply to the reality of the average New Yorker, especially in this district. Yeah. While Kiana looks for that, um, when this was drafted last year, that was kind of the language that was included in their kind of income and affordability study now in terms of their methodology and how they, like you said, kind of come to that number remains to be seen. And, um, but yeah, over to you, Kiana. So FYI, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, according to CNBC in September of 2020, New York bankruptcies reportedly surge 40%. So I'm still looking, but even if it dropped 28%, we are still looking at a surge. And maybe that's what we need to be spelling out. And I would add that language back with that context, if that is the case. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Can you send a few sentences, Aisha? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the purposes of time, Jay, to give Kiana a few minutes, unless you, you're ready, Kiana. Yeah. There is one more person with a hand up. Oh, okay, I missed that. Uh, Dorga Reynoso. Oh. Hi, I'm sorry, I didn't see the unmute uh, thing coming up. Hello, everyone. Um, just two things. Um, I wonder if we can also include um, in the resolution um, the apartments that are being warehoused uh, in our district. Um, there's like units uh, in my building that have been, that are uh, rent stabilized and have been warehoused for over a decade. So I, I think that maybe we can look into those and, um, and include that information if uh, possible. And also in relation uh, to the um, HPD uh, being underfunded, um, Concerns about uh, um, our council uh, person voting uh, to cut the budget and wonder what she will be doing to actually uh, get those funds back. So, um, you know, to properly fund the HPD. And um, I mean, we have like hundreds, uh, many of our buildings have like hundreds of, of pending violations that need to get resolved. So we need to really be working on that. Yeah, so the council member has been working within the council and along with her colleagues in order to demand for the mayor to restabilize the funding uh, and restore the funding specifically for HPD. Unfortunately, council member Carmen De La Rosa is not part of the budget negotiation team. So the budget negotiation team are the group of council members that work with the mayor to balance out the budget. She does not sit at that table. Um, granted, because she probably always coming against the mayor. Um, and because of that, the final uh, the final plan that the mayor and the speaker come into accordance with, she's not privy to it until it is released. Um, I also wanna acknowledge that this is exactly what happened last year. 
they gave us the presentation on a Friday and asked for a vote on a Monday. Um, and so we were basically trying to go through our main priority, trying to see which agencies were being cut and we did not have the appropriate time to see, to go through every single agency within our district. But she is working once again to make sure that all of our agencies, specifically with HPD, because again, this directly impacts our office and our district um, to make sure that they are fully funded. Um, I wanted to piggyback on uh, Dorca's mention of the warehousing in our district, uh, the two buildings that we have been uh, focused on addressing uh, the needs of 705 and 709. Right. Those buildings suffer from warehousing issues that I've personally witnessed that definitely have existed for more than a decade as well. But I know um, the councilman, previous to councilman De La Rosa, was already speaking about warehousing and the impacts in our district. I'm not sure where that is now, if there's reporting, if we have data um, that shows the amount, um, because then we could include that in the reso as well. Right. Aisha, we have four months asking them for that data. Mm. That says something. Um, <laughs> Any other hands, Jay? Because I do want to move on. Um, no. no? And when okay. you say asking them, you're talking about HPD? Yes. So I, I just an aside, I think that our committee should move to um, put forward a resolution, a resolution to HPD to insist that a study is done um, and that the data is released to us. There is a motion on the floor. Would someone like to second or ask questions about the motion? I'll second it. That's Jay. Okay. Yeah. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I see. Yeah. Bruce, I'm assuming that's a, an I since your hand I. is raised. Can you confirm? <laughs> yeah, that's an I. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I. Um, any opposed? I don't think I see any oppositions. Okay. Bruce, your hand is up again. <laughs> okay. Got it. Just want to make sure. Um, okay. Thank you. Not a problem. Um, okay, so um, motion passes. The question is timing, um, Aisha, because we have this resolution and then Jay's presenting another resolution shortly. Um, I think what you mentioned is incredibly important as well. Um, can I suggest in terms of capacity of the committee that we work on it in June? And if we're open to that, can someone put forward a motion for us to table the drafting of that resolution for our June meeting? Which resolution for the warehousing? The warehousing. Absolutely. Okay. That sounded like a, a motion. And a second, please. I'll second. Okay, great. Thank you, Jay. All, of, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, aye. aye. Okay. Any opposed? I don't see any oppositions. Okay. It passes. Great. So we'll have that then um, as an agenda item for our June meeting um, for, for discussion and, and, you know, the draft resolution for us to kind of go through that and vote. Um, on timing, can I, I think we're done with this agenda item and this draft <laughs> resolution. Um, I've captured some of those points. Clearly, there needs to be some updates. Uh, some of you will kind of and we'll work on it together and have it ready for the um, general board meeting later this month. Um, is there a motion on the floor for us to, as the committee, to vote on to, on this resolution, recognizing the edits that need to happen? I, I motion. 
for us to support this resolution. Thank you, Aisha. Is there a second? I think that was Emily. Okay. <laughs> um, all in favor? Aye. Others? Aye. 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 Okay, I see a, a thumbs up from Marshall. Any opposed? And so the motion again on the floor is for, to support this resolution. So the one on the rent guidelines board uh, proposing uh, a rent rollback, um, but also stating in it, you know, some of the points that colleagues made um, earlier. So clearly it needs to be updated with those, you know, points there. Any opposition? We're still doing the warehousing. No, no. So the warehousing passed. Is this for the resolution. No, I'm saying for for this resolution, are we including information about warehousing, even though there's no actual data? That could we could do. I mean, it could be just a simple whereas, and maybe even in that stating that you know HPD hasn't um, um, hasn't um, you know put forward that information or, or something like that. Are there any, is, sorry, go ahead, Jay. I was gonna say, I just don't think there's any actual data. So I don't see why we, uh, since we're gonna do one specifically on that, I don't think it needs to be added to this one. Point. Um, yeah, I think the only, I mean, from what I can recall, the only time this has been confirmed as, I think, a landlord association saying, yes, we warehouse apartments after a report came out. Okay, I'm not hearing any kind of strong oppositions to that. So I'll, I'll take that as a friendly amendment. Um, thank you, Jay. Any oppositions to this resolution noting the change that Jay suggested as well as some of the other bits and pieces that we discussed? Okay, seeing none, it passes um, and it will go for full um, vote in front of the entire community board uh, at the general meeting. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, uh, Kiana. Thank you, Jamila, for, for joining us this evening. Um, really appreciate your time as always. Thank you all. Thank you all. And Mario, I'll get you all that information tomorrow and I'll email it to you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Right. Have a good night. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you guys for tonight. Kiana did most of the talking because she's the best at it. <laughs> <laughs> Amila the main. Uh, I believe that Tiffany has put, put in the chat information that may be relevant to the vacancy. I mean, to the, is that for warehousing, Tiffany? Yes, yes, yes. I, I was actually trying to search myself. Okay. And I was going to say, um, maybe we can kind of put a pin in it. If we find supporting information, we include it. If we don't, then we exclude it. But um, it seems like Tiffany may have hit on some. Okay. Um, noted. Okay. Thank you uh, for sharing those links. Um, moving on to the next agenda item, and I do want to note the the time. Um, so if you all recall, at the last um, committee meeting, we had council member Abreu join us um, and talk about the right to council uh, and some of the legislation that he was putting forward, both an intro as well as a resolution. Um to city council on, you know, the right to council. And we as a committee voted to port it. And so Jay has very helpfully pulled together a draft for the, um, the, the resolution. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And then Jay, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I am gonna kind of time this conversation if it's okay. Um, I'll, I'll give us 15 minutes so that way we can you can present it. Uh, we can have a discussion if colleagues want to kind of give, you know, friendly edits and then we can vote on it. Is that all right? 
I'm going to share my screen in a second for you, and then I'll turn it over to you, Jay. No pressure. Timing me. <laughs> You'll do just fine. Um, so you. this is my first resolution for the community board, so I wasn't sure if I did it right. I just followed kind of the instructions you gave me, Maria. Uh, so right off the bat, um, it's just the first paragraph kind of delineating that we support right to counsel. Um, and at the end of that paragraph is just uh, expressing uh, the that this resolution is in support of intro 927 and 499. And then I tried to give some information uh, here first on like, what has been said that is needed to fully fund right to counsel. Uh, took one from testimony from the right to counsel NYC organization. Um, and also some information from a news article mentioning where they were currently funded and how much they needed. Um, and that's where I put the information of supporting intro nine to one and then moving from there uh we go through the third whereas where we're talking about some data points and and uh then one data point from community service society about how right to counsel was helpful in decreasing the number of eviction filings and then move on to uh where I say New York City currently has 160 active eviction cases. Um, I thought I linked that, but that's uh, linked and uh, that's part of New York City uh, right to counsel or data that they're actively uh, posting. And uh, then we move on to the resolution that Councilman Abreu has 499, which has which is the one that calls on the state legislature to pass and sign um, a bill sponsored by Hoyleman and Assemblywoman, Senator Hoyleman and Assemblywoman Rosenthal uh, to require uh, local governments that provide legal representation will uh, make it so that it will require the courts to advise a party that they have a right to counsel and adjourn the eviction proceedings until that person get, gets counsel, which is the current problem that's not allowed in New York City, which is an effort to um, kind of like delay the cases while they continue to. And then the last part was basically um, just a sentence of kind of layout of the issue and the board supporting uh, the city council to pass intro nine to one and the resolution four four nine. Thank you, Jay, for um, the initiative and the work. Really appreciate your your leadership on that. Um, I see a hand, Richard. Oh, you're muted. Hold on. Trying to unmute you, Richard. There you go. I am prepared to second Jay's motion to present this resolution. <laughs> I, I, I like the quickness. I like the quickness. But I but I did um, see Aisha's hand. Is it? Um, can I take Aisha's point? There's plenty um, of room for discussion, but. That's what belongs out there. <laughs> Aisha? Um, so can we, oh, so to begin with, um, it needs a title. Well, it does say resolution of support of right to counsel. Okay, mm -hmm. I just need it in the body of the. We can put um, that in there. Um, great effort um, on your first resolution. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. um, I Can we scroll to the bottom and, I, and I'm, Still a little hairy on everything in the middle, but it sounds great. And it looks like it includes all the bells and whistles. 
I might break it up into smaller whereases, um, but I'm I'm not sure because I have to read through at the top. And I'm just trying to understand what the resolved is doing, recognizing the rise in eviction cases after the end of the eviction moratorium and the labor. So we're we're supporting uh, the council members. Um, Intro 921 and resolution 449 on right to counsel. That's what we're calling. And 921, um, Aisha, is the one that requires the, I forget the name of the office on top, but it just requires them to basically. Office of Civil study, Justice. Uh, yeah. Study uh, what, what you would need to basically get right to counsel fully funded based on how much they currently pay uh, mm -hmm. the lawyers in the city law department to do the same work. And and for, for everyone's knowledge, um, we did engage with the council member's office in terms of the language, um, kind of pulling from that language in uh, both the intro and the resolution. Richard, is that another? And I know you did put a motion forward. So I do want to uh, respect our Robert's rules. Mm. So I guess that's an old hand. Um, so can we get a second? So Richard motioned um, for the committee to... Um, support this resolution. It sounds like there may be one or two friendly amendments and it's just in terms of formatting of maybe kind of spacing out a little bit. And I think that's something that can be done offline um, and that can be sorted. Um, but there is a motion on the floor to support this resolution. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Aisha. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Bruce, that's an aye. What's your hand? Okay, Marsh, see your thumb. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, awesome. Any opposed? Bruce, uh, having problems with your, <laughs> your button because you had your hand up for yes. Now it's up against. You can just clarify uh, your. I'm sorry, what did you say, Mario? Um, no, I was asking uh, because I see that your hand was up for the yes, and it was also up for the no. Oh, um, I thought so I took it down for the no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I support the resolution, thank you. Got it, thank you. Um, I did not see any objections, so uh, this passes. Um, well done, Jay. Um, we'll kind of, again, take offline the, you know, just to kind of maybe space it out a little bit and, you know, so, you know, flesh out the title, but, um, thank you, um, for your support and leadership on this. Okay. Um, moving on to the next point in our agenda and realizing that it's, a uh, we've had a long, but very helpful, um, conversation this evening. It's new business. Um, under new business, we have updates from elected representatives and updates from community organizations. We've obviously already had um, council member that Rosa's office, and I don't see any other representatives on here. As I mentioned at the last meeting, this is now kind of to be a standing agenda item where members of uh, community organizations and elected representatives can join us if they have updates. Um, I believe Emily is working with We Act to possibly join us in June for uh, you know a short presentation on some of the work that they do in our district. So thank you, Emily, for working on that. Um, I know that there's one point under new business that um, Tiffany would like to raise. Um, Tiffany, if I can pass it over to you um, minutes to present your um, your item. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you would be able to allow sh uh, screen sharing or great. Thank um, you. I'll, I'll go ahead and share what you sent me. Okay, perfect. 
So while um, Mariel is pulling that up, I just wanted to do a quick intro. My name is Tiffany Kahn. I am a member of Community Board 9, which is mostly West Harlem and parts of Morningside. Um, I uh, wrote a resolution regarding the HPD grant. It is the title, the full title is the HPD Home First Down Payment Assistance Program. Uh, I'm actually going to include a copy of the reso in the chat. I put, it's a Google Docs link. So anyone can click on it and view it. You would have to get permission because it's Google, it's on Google Drive. But once I get a notification, I can just give you permission to view it. Anyhow, um, briefly, this grant is designed to allow renters to become homeowners. Um, the biggest barrier to home ownership has been identified across the nation as being the down payment. Most banks and co-ops and other entities will request a minimum of 20% down payment. If it's anything less than 20%, banks will require borrowers to pay something called PMI, which is a private mortgage insurance, uh, which drives up the monthly expenses, et cetera, et cetera. It's always better to put down more. And that is typically, it's literally price prohibitive. So um, the federal government, HUD, um, through different municipal agencies, gives this down payment assistance. It is 20% up to $100,000 of the total principal. My apologies, I have a three-year-old in the background it's making a lot of noise. And I'm just going to, one quick Sorry about that. Um, yes, uh, I'll just, where was I? Okay, so uh, the, the uh, chart that you see here, this was um, taken from the city's website. Housing, as we all know, is one of the primary concerns of a lot of community boards, especially uh, West Harlem. Um, and so if you go to the top, I talk about the housing crisis that we have at a national level. And this crisis exists in not only the renter market and uh, also the Mitchell Lama are under attack, HDFCs as well, but of course the single family multifamily homes, which recently a lot of private equity and other groups have been using as cash cows. They're purchasing these um, homes. My family's from Brooklyn. This is happening across Brooklyn and the other boroughs where they're purchasing them and turning them into quasi luxury rentals, um, et cetera. And so that's another, interests that prospective buyers have to compete against. Um, so the first, whereas we've had a housing crisis since the 1970s, um, and at this time, the middle class is facing a double burden, even a triple burden of not only the soaring costs of, of homes, but also inflation. And if you're a younger person, you're most likely saddled with student loan debt, et cetera. Um, if you scroll down a little bit further, we all know uh, or most people know that the primary way that the middle class builds equity is through their home. Athena, stop it. Sorry, one second. Sorry about that. Mariel, I saw that you had a child in the background. My instinct. Yes, I get it. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> um, so home ownership, again, is the primary way that the middle class builds wealth. If you look at net wealth or sorry, net worth for uh, renters compared to homeowners, it is significantly higher for homeowners than it is for renters. For those of you who can't read the presentation, it's approximately $336,000 is the net worth for the average homeowner compared to just $5,700 for renters. I believe that is a, a national average. In New York, the difference is significantly higher. The gap between the two is significantly higher. Um, I, I, I promised I would keep this short, so I'm just gonna scroll, if you can just go scroll down a little bit, yes. And this issue, these gaps, these wealth disparities is much higher between black, white, and Hispanic communities. Um, I forgot to also mention, um, sorry, well, I'll just, I'll just scroll down. So the point is this type of a program is crucial. I cannot stress how important this HPD Home First Assistance Program is to breathing life 
not only in our communities, not only supporting housing, but it also helps with small businesses right? Um, for a number of reasons. A lot of people who are trying to start a business, for example, um, can either borrow against the value of their home to take out something called a HELOC, that's a home equity line of credit. There are a number of other tools. Even just having their credit score boosted by owning a home and making those mortgage payments will make them more credit worthy in the eyes of a bank if they do decide to start a small business. And with a lot of these big box retailers, we're seeing a shrinkage of small and medium-sized businesses. Now, just going to the very, to the, the therefore be it resolved portion, the primary problem with this program, uh, there are a number of problems with the program, some of which is that they look at national averages, not New York City averages, um, including income. The application fee is also incredibly high. It's $850, which again, this is targeting a low to moderate income applicant. So that's a pretty high application fee. But rather than giving a laundry list of all of the ways that the program could or should be improved, I was concerned that when you do this, it gets lost on the listener and it definitely gets lost on HPD or others who can actually make those changes. So I decided to focus solely on what I think is one of the, the most, um, the biggest barriers which is that the duration truly hurts applicants. It always took a long time. Government is notorious for being slow, but now I'm hearing four to six months, even longer than six months for the application to be processed. I've said before, and I'll say it again, when Martin Luther King says, justice delayed is justice denied, a grant delayed is a grant rejected. There are a lot of people who are not even applying to the program because they don't even know if they'll get the grant despite paying this application fee and all of the hurdles. Oh, and I, there's another thing that's not mentioned. When you have to get your home inspected, you have to pay for that inspection and it expires after 90 days. So then people have to spend again for this. It's, it, it really does hurt a lot of people to have the application duration last half a year, especially in a climate like in New York City, where you have you know, buyers with much deeper pockets, they don't even need mortgages, they can pay all cash. So a seller would not waste their time with someone who needs a grant. So the ask is that we, um, so my board CB9 already passed this resolution. I'm, I believe very strongly in communities working with community groups, not just operating in silos and also building awareness because there may be someone in your building next door to you who could benefit from this program and doesn't even know that it exists. So please each one, teach one, share that this program exists. And also again, that we ask that HPD caps the application duration to one month. The paperwork is basically, is very straightforward. It's things like your W-2s, your bank statements. It's not rocket science. It shouldn't take more. Banks have to process this. The co-op boards, if you're applying for a co-op, for example, will ask for the same paperwork and they can go through it within days. There's no reason why it should take months for this to, to process. So to cap it to no more than one or two months, and if an applicant has already submitted an application and is forced to close or lose, that applicant should not be disqualified. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, very helpful uh, for you to, to share that with us. Um, Aisha, over to you. Um, and let me just kind of keeping an eye on the time. It's already 9.03. So if we can keep this discussion to um, no longer than 10 minutes, uh, that would be great. Aisha? Um, so before I begin, quick side notes. Uh, there was language at the top, which I don't remember because I got really engrossed in what the purpose of this resolution is for, mm -hmm. which I definitely, oh, I know what it was, uh, about housing, affordable housing being the most pressing issue across multiple districts. I think that's something that we can use in our RGB resolution. I just wanted to put that out there. But um, also, there I, I haven't really dug into it, but I've seen where it's being stated. Uh, I don't know if it's a proposal or if it's been enacted where uh, people of higher credit scores 
would have to pay higher interest rates for mortgages. And I think that this that's something, and I, this just reminded me of that. So I want to make sure um, to put it on the floor um, so that we can discuss it at a later date. Um, that being said, for this resolution, I absolutely love um, learning about this, um, support it, um, appreciate the intent. And I believe if you scroll, can you scroll to the bottom again? Um, oh, so I agree with reducing the application period. And I wonder, does the program have a pre-approval function, right? So that the person is not applying yes. if they've already located a house, but before, and, and how does that work? Are they given a range of what a grant might look like depending on the home that they seek or what, what does that look like? Okay, so before I forget, you actually, you said a pre-approval process and I, I forgot to mention that um, applicants have to go through a workshop which is, uh, depending on the nonprofit, it could be approximately one month, for example, um, where they learn everything about how to purchase and maintain a home. So, and it's very comprehensive. Not any nonprofit can give that workshop. It must be HPD accredited, which means they've already been vetted by this nonprofit. So for the HPD to then take another six months is, mind boggling why it would, you know, if they've already been vetted, but anyhow, to your question about caps and restrictions, there is no cap on the purchase price, but obviously if you are lower or moderately income, if your, if your income is low to moderate, you would not be buying a, a $3 million or $5 million home, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the bank would not approve of it anyway. Um, does that answer that question? Well, so in essence, what you're saying is they are already approved, but once they find the house that they're seeking, just the processing, not even an attempt to approve them, is what's what the delay is? There's really no explanation. But finalizing it? Is that what's, what's there's taking a, long? There's a, a very much a lack of transparency in a lot of things. Uh, and also HPD actually outsources the application processing to NHS, which is Neighborhood Housing Services. That's a nonprofit. It's one of a number of nonprofits, um, but they are the ones that have the contract right now with, uh, with HPD um, to process these applications. I really would love to know, and this is perhaps for a future thing, but again, I did not want to overwhelm people with a lot of information, but I would really love to know the demographics of people who are A, applying and B, receiving the grant. Mm -hmm. among other things. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, ju I'm jumping around and I, I feel like I did not answer that last question. Uh, well, I know we're supposed to have HPD back. Maybe when they come back, they can bring some of that information with them. Um, but I'd like to see um, language about, I know that there's a question mark on it, but it's just my feeling that if the person goes through a process, they're qualified, they're eligible, right? And they go out to go seek a home that at that point, it, it they should already have the grant. Yeah, I agree with you because in order to even apply, you have to have a commitment letter from the bank. You have to have received a number of things from the seller. You have to already be in contract. In order to be in, and you have to, and if you're applying for a co-op, in most cases, you've already gone through an interview. You might have already, you might have gotten approvals from all these different groups, the bank, the co-op, the seller, and so on. But the only thing that's holding up your closing on this home is this grant. It, can we communicate that? Can, can the spirit of that be in the language? Um... And and I maybe I'm maybe it is already um and you know it's in maybe in the broader context of the resolution but yeah I want I want to make sure that we make that statement that this it's an unnecessary delay um that there's already you know these tiers of you know qualifications and and eligibility checking that's happening before the point that you're referencing so. I'm even wondering why 
why even the two months, right? Like, why aren't they have? Why aren't they going to the homeowner with an approval at that point? That's so the one. Homeowner, homeowner has that security to know. Yeah, this is my buyer. So, and this is not coming from me. This is uh, the co-chair of our housing land use and zoning committee of CB nine, who actually did apply for the program, and she she in fact applied for it twice. She said, um, and she gave up. She wow. said it, it, she feels like it's a scam. About, yeah. There are a lot of these, let's, how can I put this? Uh, let's call them resources or what have you that give, it's, it's almost like theater, public theater to give the illusion that, look, there's a problem and we're solving it. Mm -hmm. But the amount of bureaucracy and red tape is so heavy that it's almost like an op an illusion, really. Hmm. Um, but I feel like we can hold them to that. And this is the way to do that. This is one of the ways. There's a lot of additional improvements that the program absolutely needs. But again, my concern is when you show up with too many ass, they get lost. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Tiffany, and thank you, Aisha. Um, really helpful discussion. And actually, this is the first time I'm hearing about it. So um, it goes to, to your exact point that um, it, it really isn't being advertised. Um, just a, a question, and again, just noting the time, because we do still have one other agenda item uh, on tonight's meeting. <laughs> you mentioned that this was passed by CB9, correct? As is. Oh, and the board, you'll see in the, uh, when you click on the link in the Google Docs, okay. there were comments made by different, uh, Signe Mortensen is one of our co-chairs of CB9, and uh, Gregory, oh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his last name. He's a member of CB10. So they're two different board members. Okay. Um, they both had their own comments. Mm -hmm. uh, Signe, and uh, actually our board believes that I was requ requesting that the application fee um, be reduced from 850 to 250, but mm -hmm. they think that $50 is more reasonable. So you'll see that comment there. Okay, and do you know if um, CB10 has passed this or they're kind of still discussing, it sounds like? They're, they're strongly interested. The only mm -hmm. reason why it didn't go for a vote was because I just showed up. I didn't even know, I, I unfortunately didn't know that there was a, a meeting that was taking place that day. Um, and so it just so happened that the person who was supposed to be presenting that night canceled. And so they allowed me to speak about it for a few minutes, but, um, Charles Powell is the chair. He's very much interested. A lot of people were excited about it. I mean, it's, I don't really, I don't, I can't imagine anyone not being, but I'm happy to put you in touch with Charles Powell, um, their board chair. And it was a great lively discussion. Um, sure. I'm not sure if it was recorded, but he can also provide feedback directly. Okay. Thanks, Tiffany. Sure. Can I suggest, because it sounds as if we want to kind of do our own research on it. It, it sounds as if, um, I, at least from Aisha, I haven't heard from other uh, committee members that um, there is support for this. Um, but recognizing the time and the fact that we kind of still want to do a little bit of more research and possibly add um, some bits and pieces to it or additional language, um, but along the same lines of the spirit of what CB9 has passed, can I suggest to the committee, unless there are other hands, which I cannot see because I'm sharing my screen, um, that this is tabled um, to our June meeting uh, for a discussion and a vote then? I second that. And I I would like to read um, what Courtney, unless Courtney wants to um, state it on the record, um, I can read it. Uh, Courtney Wicker says in the chat, this is a great resolution. As someone who works with this grant, I can testify to the frustration the clients my organization serves have with the program. I wanna clarify, HPD has a contract with NHS of New, New York City to process the applications. There are different NHS organizations. Very helpful. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, and thank you, Aisha, for reading that. Um, I did hear, uh, and thank you, Tiffany, for, for joining. And apologies, because I definitely did not receive this. Um, so I'm glad you were able to join this evening and present. Um, 
uh, Aisha, you did second the uh, the motion to table this uh, resolution for discussion and vote in June. Is there uh, any objections? All right, all all in favor? We'll start with all in favor. <laughs> aye, aye. Okay. Um, aye, aye. aye. Uh, Emily, I don't think I heard from Emily or Richard. I think Bruce's hand is raised. Bruce's hand is raised. Yep, I have Marshall. I have Jay. I have you, Aisha. Thank you, Richard and Emily. How do you vote? You in favor to table this? Yeah, uh, so I... yes, okay. Um, that is enough for the vote. Maybe Emily's offline now that Emily's still working. Th thank you, Richard. Um, great, Hi. thank Hi. you. <laughs> no worries. Um, so everyone voted in favor. So uh, again, thank you, Tiffany. Uh, we'll take this offline. If you wouldn't mind putting uh, me in touch with some of the colleagues you mentioned, and then we can kind of do our research um, and be able to have kind of a more uh, in-depth discussion on it in June. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you all for allowing me. Thank that. you. Um, all right. So uh, last but not least, moving on to old business. Um, I don't think there's any other new uh -huh. business. Um, moving on to old business. Um, yesterday I joined the, um, land use committee meeting, um, to, in their discussion on housing Manhattanite. So this is the Manhattan Borough President's, uh, kind of plan to identify sites across, um, Manhattan for potential developments in an, in an effort to address kind of, you know, the housing crisis, but also uh, housing affordability. Um, and I, I know that you were on the land use committee. Is it okay if I turn it over to you to maybe kind of share uh, in a minute or two really quickly what we discussed? Sure. And if I leave any holes, um, because I haven't read the plan yet, but um, it's my understanding that the borough president's office is proposing a housing plan wherein they are um, highlighting potential sites where affordable housing can be developed. Um, the context of the meeting at, at land use was uh, for us to propose additional sites in our district um, and then to have a walking tour where we will review all of the proposed sites that have already been proposed as well as the ones that we propose ourselves um, to the community. Um, they will be scheduled on specific dates. And for people who are unable to participate on the dates that are scheduled, they will be provided a map um, showing where, where the designated sites are, information um, related, and giving a range of time so that people can participate in looking for themselves or participating in the walk, but also where there will potentially be a Google form to gather any feedback from the community um, so that we can, uh, I guess, make future proposals at a, at a later date and time. So ho hopefully I covered Yep, pr pretty much. Um, and, and ultimately, what we would like this to, in terms of the timing, as you mentioned, we're looking at June, so it is a quick turnaround. Um, so any of you who want uh, are interested in getting involved in the effort, and I see Tiffany, you're still on, um, in case you're still um, kind of listening as well. Uh, definitely something that uh, will probably, you know, also encourage other community boards to do. Um, you know, kind of really canvas. Uh, our communities and find uh, sites um, that can be used and, and developed for affordable housing. Uh, but ultimately, what we would like to come out of these walks um, and kind of conversations, so this would be done in you know conjunction with community partners, elected representatives, so on and so forth, would hopefully uh, be some type of forum or workshop with community stakeholders, um, also including developers as well. To kind of talk about what is it that you know us as you know residents of CB12 kind of what has come out of that and what you know what does that look like for Washington Heights so um, we're working again closely with the land use committee on that so if you're interested in getting involved um, let me know and we can uh, take that forward thank you Aisha super helpful thank you 
Um, all right. Is there any other old business? Okay. I do not see any hands. Do I hear a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting? Long, but a very kind of, I think, very uh, uh, important meeting. We discussed a lot of important things and got a lot of business done. <laughs> I see a hand, Bruce, but I, I I think we need to verbally hear it. I move to to uh, close. Second, anyone? I second. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, everyone, um, for. Uh, I see uh, Emily's hand was raised. I'm not sure if that was the second or a motion or is that something? Ooh. Yes, Emily. I know Emily's no, at an event. Sorry, I, okay. Sorry, I accidentally clicked <laughs> on that. <laughs> oh, no worries. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Um, thanks for all you do, and um, we'll be in touch. Good night. Good night. Yeah, Good night, everyone.